Is mental health genetic habit or personality? And how can you improve or master it? Yeah, well, it's all of those things, you know. You might say, well, it's unfair that it's genetic. Well, look, we all have different temperaments, okay? There's five dimensions of temperament. Extroversion, that's sensitivity and threshold for positive emotion. Neuroticism, that's sensitivity and threshold for negative emotion. Agreeableness, that's kind of maternal compassion and empathy versus a kind of tough, more individualized, what would you call it? Decisiveness. Yeah, good. Conscientiousness, that's dutifulness, industriousness and orderliness. Openness, that's creativity and interest in ideas. Five dimensions. Okay. Where you land on those dimensions is determined to a large degree by the genetic lottery. And now there's some movement on each dimension that can occur as a consequence of socialization, but it's bounded by the place you landed when the cards were dealt by the genetic code when you were born. And you might say, well, that's unfair. It's like, well, it's, it's not unfair exactly. It's, it's just, there's a randomness about it within a bounded world. And it's not unfair partly because every advantage comes with a disadvantage. So if you're extroverted, you're social and you're positive, but you're impulsive. And you can tilt towards hedonism and you can't stand being alone. If you're high neuroticism, well, you suffer a lot of anxiety and pain, but you're pretty sensitive to threat and you might see danger before anyone else does and then you don't die. And so, and maybe your children don't either. And if you're agreeable, well, you're compassionate and caring, but you're going to not stand up for yourself very well and you're gonna, your, your temptation is going to be bitterness and resentment. If you're conscientious, well, you're orderly and industrious, but you can get obsessive. And if you're creative, well, then you end up with purple hair and nose rings. And <laughs> I did a study at Harvard in like 1994 when piercing and tattooing started to first emerge on the cultural landscape because we were trying to find out if it was a marker for psychopathology, which wasn't obvious at that point. Well, because it was a subcultural uh, practice before that, eh? it was circus people and prisoners and so forth that were tattooed and who were pierced. And then it spilled into the mainstream and we were curious as I was in the psychopathology and personality sub-department in the Harvard Department of Psychology and I worked with a, a colleague of mine, Jill Hooley, and we never published this study. Uh, many studies end up not published, but but it was very interesting. The best predictor of tattooing and piercing was just creativity. There was no sign of assorted, assorted psychopathology, except the psychopathology associated with creativity. And you might say, well, what's that? And it's like, well, most creative ideas are stupid and wrong. <laughs> so, you know, why shouldn't you have ideas? Well, because most of your ideas aren't any good. And how do you know that? Well, try starting a business. You, the probability that you're going to fail is extremely high. Most people who end up with a successful business have failed multiple times because it's very hard to figure out what the market needs this moment. It's really hard and so you'll flail around trying to hit that target and if you're creative you're going to come up with a lot of ideas but that doesn't mean they're good and even if they are good doesn't mean they'll work. And so most people, because most people aren't creative by the way, they're not even a little bit creative, and that's because creativity is a high-risk, high-return strategy, and um, if you win, you can win big, but the probability that you lose is pretty damn high. Hardly anybody makes any money from a book, and it's really hard to write a book. And like, how many books have you written? None. And, and how many successful books have you written? And, you know, like there's a one in a hundred chance, maybe, that you've written a book. I doubt if it's that high. Like, actually written and published a book. It's probably more like one in a thousand. And then, 99.9% .9 of books sell less than 200 copies. 
So you got a one in a million chance at best of writing a book that is going to be successful. You know, and you might ask, well then why bother? And the answer is, well most people don't. That's how they solve that problem. Just don't do that. And then you won't fail. And most of you probably haven't written a symphony, or even a song, or a play, and you probably haven't, you probably don't dance, but some of you do, but I doubt if you've ever generated a truly original dance, except by accident, and then generally people will just laugh about that. So, we, we, we studied creative achievement across a wide range of people. We had a, developed a 13 domain scale with eight levels of competence in each domain, so on the musical front it would be you know, I have no training or, or, uh, or interest in this area. To, uh, you know, I've written original compositions that have been played internationally by, by major musicians. And uh, you sum across all 13 domains and the median score, which is the most typical score, is zero. And 70% of people score zero. And the next most common score is one. And that's like, now you've got 80% of people. Okay, what's my point? No matter where you land in the temperamental landscape, you're going to have your associated faults and temptations. And you're going to have your associated proclivity to your particular form of mental illness. So, now, that might visit you if you're particularly unlucky, or you might fall into that if you're incautious. But you generally don't get an advantage without an attendant disadvantage. So that's on the genetic front, and then there's environmental variability, for sure. You can take a neurotic child, the studies have already been done on this, so some children by, let's say two, although you can actually measure this by six months, so imagine you have a child in a room, a lab, and his or her mother is there, and the mother is sitting, and the child's here, and then a little wheeled robot is, is remote controlled in by the experimenter. Well, some kids will just run right over and engage with the robot, and other kids will hide behind their mother and then sort of peek out. And the ones who hide are higher in negative emotion. And then if it's a baby-eating robot, they're not dead. So that's their strategy, whereas the... <laughs> you know, hey, your kids are going to go play with a strange dog at the, at the playground, you know, or not. And sometimes that's real fun. And sometimes it's no fun at all. And sometimes it's the you know, kid who's hiding behind his mother's legs that doesn't have his face torn off by the pit bull. So there's variability for a reason. You know, and then the more neurosis prone, the more kids more prone to negative emotion, they're going to suffer from a higher proclivity for depression and anxiety later in their life. And that's the price they pay for their threat sensitivity. But um, if you take those kids and you really encourage them to explore voluntarily instead of facilitating their proclivity to hide themselves you can tilt them up into the normal range for negative emotion and those studies have already been done and so you're never going to take a kid who's really high in trait neuroticism and make them as low in trait neuroticism as someone you know at the 99.9th percentile genetically you just can't and maybe you could do it if you did nothing else than train that child like 12 hours a day for 10 years but you can shift people a fair bit and if you're introverted you can you can learn extroverted skills and if you're agreeable you can learn to stand up for yourself and um, if you're unconscientious you can learn to discipline yourself although that's a tricky one because um, you usually don't have the discipline to discipline yourself if you're unconscientious so <laughs> So, and then in terms of habit, well, you become what you practice. And so, if you're high in neuroticism, it's going to take a lot of practice to, to get you all calmed down. But that's what you do in psychotherapy with people all the time, because a large number of people who are in therapy have higher than average levels of negative emotion, and you make them, you help them become stronger. And the way you do that is by strategizing with them and encouraging them to confront the things that they're afraid of and avoid and avoiding and they become more able and more courageous as a consequence of doing so and you can shift people quite a lot doing that and that's what you do when you learn and that's how you teach kids and it's the universal mechanism of adaptation and you try to speed that up in psychotherapy and you can do that for yourself you know like 
this is a really useful, um, what would you call it, R ritual, routine. So, look, you've got a goal, and you'll see that as you progress towards the goal, there'll be obstacles that emerge, and some of them you don't want to confront. You're going to shy away from them, you know. So maybe I'm, I have a client, and they're being tyrannized at work, and they need to get another job, and to do that, they have to put their CV in order, and they're embarrassed about their CV, and they don't even want to open the file on their computer that contains their CV, which they haven't looked at for 10 years, and which contains nothing but a record of their dismal failures in the past, as far as they're concerned, and that's a box that's locked, that's Pandora's box, with a dragon in it, and they don't want to go anywhere near it. And no wonder, you know, but if they're going to get another job, well, unless they get their resume together, they're stuck under the thumb of their local tyrant, and that's not a good deal. And so often what you do with someone like that is you say, uh, just print your resume. Don't even look at the bloody thing. Just print it, turn it upside down, put it in an envelope, and bring it to the session the next week. And then the person will come back and say, you know, that task that we agreed on, because you have to agree on these things. I didn't do it. I, I couldn't even... I couldn't even sit at the computer. And so then you say, well, do you think this week you could just sit at the computer and think about opening your resume? And they might say, yes. And then they come back the next week and said, you know, I didn't even sit at the computer and think about my resume. So then you say, okay, we'll do it right now. Okay, close your eyes. Okay, now, imagine your computer. Bring it to mind as, as vividly as you can. Right Now, imagine you're walking into your room and now the goal is to sit at your computer. So now why don't you tell me what happens. So imagine your office. Okay, now you're walking in. Now tell me what happens. You're going to walk towards your computer. Just describe it. I, first I sit down. Okay. And how are you feeling? Relaxed. Oh, well, you're not much help in this particular example. <laughs> no, you mean terrified out of your skull. Oh, you want me to be terrified? Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. You didn't say that. <laughs> she, she's not very high in neuroticism, by the way. As you can tell, because she's married to me. So, okay. So uh, okay, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, so I'm terrified. Okay, so what's happening? Good, good. <laughs> so what's happening with your breathing? Shallow. Okay, so, 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 so try to... Pay attention to your feet for a minute. Okay, they're now. twitching. They're twitching, yes. Okay, so just try to so let them kind of sit heavily on the floor. Okay. okay now pay attention to your calves and, mm. and let them relax. And then you walk the person through their body and you say, now pay attention to your breathing. Just, just relax. Now you don't have to do this with people, but it's a good thing for them to learn. Okay, now, so how are you feeling? Oh, by the way, you're feeling slightly better. I am feeling slightly yeah. better, yeah. Okay, good, <laughs> good, good. <laughs> Now, um, imagine that you just turn on your computer. Okay, so what happens when you just turn on your computer? You get more nervous. I have a shallow breathe. Yeah, yeah okay, okay. So now you, you get the point, and then you walk the person through turning on their computer and then opening up the dread folder and then reading the title of the horrible dragon resume and then maybe opening it. And then you say, that's good enough for this week. And then maybe the person can go home and just open their damn resume. And then maybe they can print it out and bring it to you. And then maybe you can go through the sub-reptiles one by one, you know, and clean out the snakes. It's like, well, what were you doing between 2011 and 2013? And the answer is, that is the last thing that I want to discuss with anyone. Right? So there's a lacuna, there's a hole in the account, in the autobiographical account, and chaos itself is looking through that with all that disorder and shame and malevolence lurking in the background and no one wants to look at that and think, well, you didn't do a very good job between 2012 and 2013 and you've got a hole in your record and... <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we, <laughs> right, right, and we need to do something about that now. And so, you know, how do we address that so that you have a coherent account of yourself? And look, this could take a good while, right, to put that all back together. That's your whole past to put that together in a manner that you could, that you could uh, 
confidently bring forward to a new potential employer, but it's worth it if you escape from tyranny and you now have a coherent account of yourself and you've atoned for your past inadequacies, let's say, and you're ready to move forward and partly what you do in therapy and partly what you should do with yourself is is not hide all that in the fog, you know, so you know where you are, so you can figure out where you're going, and, and then practice doing that, and then as you practice doing that, then that's what you become, and that will lower your proclivity to negative emotion, definitely, as you put your life together. That's why it's useful to order your room. Chaotic room makes you anxious. Why? Too many pathways, man. You walk into someone's room and you think, what the hell is going on here? Maybe that's your teenager's bedroom. And you've pretty much summed it up in the question. It's like, yeah, it's a little slice of hell in that room, you know? And so, and how do you feel when you're there? Like you'd rather be anywhere else. And no wonder, because everything in the room is broadcasting chaos and disorder at you. And so that's another thing I used to do with my clients, typical behavioral maneuver, which is, if you're anxious, organize your surroundings a bit. You know, simplify, declutter, organize bit by bit. Order, habitable order. The habitable order that is good. All of that. It's a recreation of the original Eden, metaphysically speaking. And you can do that very practically, and then you practice that, and that'll sort you out. You know, assuming you're not physically ill. And even then, well, sometimes, you know, to the degree you can get yourself, yeah, right, together. <laughs> yeah. You know, bit by bit, you'll even push physical illness into abeyance, not least because you decrease your stress response, and that's fight or flight, and fight or flight stress responses inhibit your immune system. And so, if you're always in a state of chaos, your immune system is suppressed, and you're far more likely to get it, to become ill. So, you put order in place of accidental chaos, and everything snaps into place. And, uh, and there isn't anything better you can do than that. It's, it's, and there's no limit to how much of that you can do. You know, you start locally. Start with the things that are right in front of you. There's plenty of problems that are right within your grasp. You know, they might seem trivial to you, but they're not. Because the things you do aren't trivial. And that's just where you have to start. And then, you know, once you got yourself kind of ordered locally, well then, start making your relationships harmonious and once you're good at that, then you got a whole group of people around you that are behind you and then you can expand outward from there. And there's no end to that. That's the opportunity and responsibility. And uh, That's the pathway to meaning, and that's the antidote to suffering. So, those are all good things to know. And that's a good place to stop. So, that's where we'll stop. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone. Very nice to see you all. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. You're welcome. Good night, everyone.